This is Isaac Morehouse. Welcome to the podcast where we discuss education, entrepreneurship, big ideas, how to put them into practice in the real world, and above all, how to live free. Joining me today is Harris Kenny, the marketing manager for Aleph Objects, uh, the maker of Lulzbot 3D Printer in lovely Loveland, Colorado. Harris, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Isaac. Thanks for having me on. You bet. You bet. Um, I was going to say never trust a man with two first names, but you really don't have two first names. It's more like a last name followed by a first name. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I've had a lot of challenges in my life and that's definitely one I, of them. I don't want to, I don't want to downplay <laughs> the challenges that you face. Um, so before we talk about the world of 3d printing in general, uh, and all the cool stuff you guys are working on, what, what you think the future holds for the industry, I want to talk about Aleph objects as a company, because you guys are really, really unique in the way that you're run. Uh, I'm going to read this little blurb from your website to frame it up. Built upon the philosophy of freedom, Aleph Objects Inc. is transforming the 3D printing industry. We are committed to libre innovation, which means the hardware and software we create is free to be copied, modified, and converted by all users. Empowering customers is part of our innovative spirit and why we set out to manufacture the Lulzbot line of rapid prototyping 3D printers, the first ever hardware products to receive the Respect Your Freedom certification from the Free Software Foundation. So what does it mean uh, that you guys are committed to Libre Innovation and you, you sort of just share all of your secrets of the products you make? How, what, what does that mean and how does that look in practice? Sure. So, I mean, I think, you know, where the rubber hits the road or and where it really matters is that we're focused on user freedom. So respecting the freedom that our users have uh, to see how our technology works, to understand it, make modifications, share those modifications with other people. So, you know, at the end of the day, you know, and and, and, I'm, and we can geek out on the terms and the origins and why we choose the words we do, but ultimately it's about really respecting our customers and then also respecting people that are interested in what we're doing but haven't bought something from us yet. So, um, so yeah. So, so you don't, okay, so your main business is producing and selling 3D printers but you don't patent any of the things that you make. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So how, you know, how does that affect your revenue model? If, you know, once you've made it and you've put it out there into the world and some smart person buys it and takes it apart and says, Oh, I can make this, uh, I can produce this or I can make replacement parts. Doesn't that destroy your bottom line? Sure. We get that question a lot of, hey, this sounds like a neat idea, but how, you know, like, like according, according company. to some economic <laughs> theorists, you're not supposed to exist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Unless, unless I have a, an extremely strong delusional thing, I'm pretty sure I go into a building for work and that with our company <laughs> has like 80 employees. I've so. been to the building, so it would have to be a shared hallucination. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, um, I mean, the, the short answer is we create value for customers by really providing a bundle of goods and services. And, you know, that includes, you know, really quality. So we make hardware, we make 3D printers. And so it includes reliable, consistent construction. It includes supply chain management of working with good suppliers. And then not only that, once their product is done, shipping it out to them in a box with foam that's reliable, that when it arrives on their doorstep, they take it out, it'll work. Um, providing really good sales. You know, we have a really educated sales team that really understands the technology and so they can really answer questions when people are thinking about it. And then on a customer support side and from a marketing side, you know, we really focus on equipping our customers and potential customers with information. So basically you bundle all that together and that's how, you know, we get the price for our products, not because we, you know, like other companies think that their value comes from having a sheet of paper and, uh, you know, U.S. Uh, patent and trademark office in Washington, D.C., and that that's how they are able to succeed. Um, I think they, and like us, really actually have a bundle of things that we're doing for customers that customers want to pay for and that they appreciate. That, you know, that's a really profound insight because, again, if, when you're when you're in the realm of theory, I actually was just having a discussion with some young people over the weekend about intellectual property. It's easy to get trapped imagining, well, if there weren't patent protections and, you know, the, the granting of a, a monopoly over a certain type of product or production, 
nobody would put in the time to, to develop something because it would just get stolen right away. And then the company would go out of business. And I think that notion of, you know, the value the, the reason pe people pay money for something is just because that's the only possible way to get that exact item is kind of silly. I mean, how many things like when you go buy a patio set, um, you don't buy it from the store, from the manufacturer or order it, you know, to come to your house because it's impossible for you to build it from scratch yourself. You do it because it's not worth it for you to build it from scratch yourself. And, you know, to go out there and, uh, you know, do all the things necessary to, to, to grit those economies of scale and the whole production process. Um, so I get that from an individual user standpoint, but what about other companies? I mean, are there other companies that just say, Hey, uh, Lulzbot's a great product and they put all their stuff out there. Let's just go ahead and duplicate it and undercut them on price. Has anybody tried to do that? We have not. Well, yes and no. So we've had some people do that at a smaller scale. Um, we have not had someone say, Hey, look, I'm going to invest you know, whatever the millions of dollars that we've invested as a company to, to build up the infrastructure of the company and then just do it for less. Um, but we've had people say, Hey, look, I'm going to, I'm going to build your machine at home. Is that cool? Or, Hey, I want to buy the parts from your suppliers to build 10 for me and a couple hacker buddies of mine. And, uh, you know, we just want to spend the weekend building a printer and, you know, so people do that at a smaller scale at a larger scale. We've seen bigger companies, t um, borrow ideas, like, parts of what we're doing. So components or, you know, pieces of engineering that we've designed, but not the entire machine end to end. Uh, but we've actually seen that by sharing it really benefits us a lot more than it could in theory hurt us because what we're, we're really doing is, you know, a lot of companies have developer programs, right? So they'll have developer conferences and they'll have parts of the website where you can sign up and learn about their hardware so that software developers can write for their hardware. Um, we, we do that kind of on steroids. We mm. say that you can see how everything works. So if you're developing materials, writing software programs, you will know as much about our machines as we do. There's no gates, there's no fees, there's no conferences. And so as a result of that, um, we're, it's, it's really a platform that plays really well. So people that want to develop for the industry, our platform is a great place to start because there's nothing that they have to do mm. to start developing. So if, if that makes sense. So the yeah. upside is pretty significant. So, so you, it's not only that you don't uh, patent the, the hardware or the product itself, you actually openly share sort of the, the blueprints or the, the back end uh, of the design specs of what you're actually building. Exactly. Wow. So, so you've kind of, you've kind of crowdsourced R and D in a way, right? I mean, do you have an actively engaged user community that will come and say, Hey, maybe you could, uh, you know, build this replacement part in a different way and, and that type of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We've got customers that are really engaged. So we have a forum online. It's a forum.lulzbot.com and it's got, uh, hundreds and hundreds of registered users, lots of folks just on there really digging into the, to the nitty gritty of how the machines work, hacking it, modifying it. And, you know, we pull ideas from there from customers all the time. So when, when Aleph was founded, I mean, you alluded to, you know, uh, millions of dollars going into developing what you, what you have and the products that your company is, is offering. When Aleph was founded, and I know you were not there at the founding, but I'm sure you you know the the story. Um, what was the thinking there? I mean, that's where intellectual property advocates say that this thing should have been stopped dead in the water. The, the founder should have should have been um, you know afraid to invest that many resources into something that, as like venture capitalists would say, you know he, he can't protect. There's no asset there. There's no intellectual property um, that's unique. It's just a service business, basically. Um, how did that How did that happen, and were outside investors brought in? That's a great question. So basically, the company, if you take a couple, look a couple years back, um, you know, in the mid two thousands, a project started called the Rep Rap Project, R E P R A P, and um, the Rep Rap Project was really a confluence of a bunch of other projects that came together. Um, so I guess my first uh, question, my first answer when people want to learn about the founding of the company is that it's not really this like uh, divinely inspired inventor story. It's a, it's more of like a, like an evolutionary story. If you have like this soup of different ideas and then as a result, you have the open source hardware 3d printing community emerged, but that could only happen when you had 
access to this platform called Arduino, which is how the, the brain of the printers, and you had to have access to software programs, and you had to have access to you know the internet. And so there's kind of these other projects that were happening that allowed, and out of that soup came the RepRap project. And the RepRap project is basically the idea of building a 3D printer that could print another printer. Hmm. So a self-replicating rapid prototyper. And, uh, and so our company is founded in the roots of that. And the, the 3D printing industry overall is the desktop industry is really built on sharing. So, you know, we are consistent with the, uh, the sort of the ethos of the industry. And then I'm also proud that the company itself is really applying those ideas uh, a lot further than anyone else is in, in terms of we only use free and open source software. So the software that we use internally for, um, you know, writing um, documents for spreadsheets, we're using all free open source software tools for things like that, too. So we really apply it top to bottom. So you're running an entire business without really without use of intellectual property. With, with the exception, I do notice the Lulzbot uh, name, the name of your most popular printer is trademarked. Um, is there a reason for that? Yeah, so that that is probably the... Well, so I guess the other, th the other quick answer is that we actually have lots of, you know, quote, intellectual property, but it's just all freely licensed. So all of our design files are technically protected, but they're protected under permissive licenses like Creative Commons. So it's basically how Wikipedia is built. Okay. Like, on, you know, on paper, all of Wikipedia is copyrighted, but in reality, it, it's copyrighted with a copy left license so that anyone can share it. And that's the approach that we have with all of our design files to ensure that they stay uh, free and open. Um, so it's, it's basically as far as we can go. Um, and yeah, yeah, but the company has a trademark over the company name, OLF objects, and then over Lulzbot and, um, and that's it. <laughs> and, and the reason for that is, is so that no one, uh, is selling something with confusingly putting that name on it and claiming that it's, you know, Lulzbot, you want to make sure that people know what they're getting when they're purchasing it. Yeah. I mean, basically, yeah, people, you know, because our, our company is built so strongly on our brand. Um, want people to know what it is. Yeah, if, if what they're getting is, it, people are getting what they think they're getting. Uh, and, you know, and that one piece of, you know, quote IP that we've had has cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, in uh, in a challenge we got, which we won, um, but it was a pretty bogus uh, trademark suit filed against us and it cost the company a ton of money. So the only thing that we have has been a huge pain in the neck. <laughs> wow. wow. So who, who uh, what was the genesis of that lawsuit? If you don't mind me uh, No, I don't. I mean, I'm not sure... I, so I'm not sure how much detail I can go into because I know we won and we're kind of, <laughs> it's, it's fine. But I mean, basically there was a company that, that um, did like software development, web development services that had kind of a similar name. And basically when the, when the company registered for the Lulzbot trademark, um, there's like 90 days to petition. And I, I'm not a lawyer here, so I'm pretty sure this is right, but you know, give or take. Um, on basically on the last day, they filed a challenge of that and saying that we shouldn't get it. And basically, it took you know over a year and a half of kind of going back and forth with them. And there's like different categories of products that you can get trademarks for. And uh, you know, we make hardware. They do software development services, and our names are, I think, pretty different enough. Um, they didn't think so, but anyway, they ended up losing and. Anyway, but it, it was just a huge, it was yeah. a huge pain in the neck. Yeah. So, okay. So yeah. your, you know, your sort of research and development department, and I, I did have the pleasure of visiting, uh, it was a couple of years ago now, um, really cool facility. I mean, it was just, it, it was awesome. It was amazing to, to see things being built, uh, very open and, and interesting and interested staff. I mean, they took me right in, were showing me what they were working on. They were very excited about it. Really cool. But so in a typical manufacturing interest or a technology company, I, I would assume, and this is kind of what, you know, the standard line is the people who are doing R and D that are incentivized by things like patents. If you're researching something that's unique that you can patent, then it becomes more monetizable or protectable. Um, and so you're always, I mean, my, my grandfather used to work at Dow chemical and it was like his, you know, big proud thing that he had three or four patents. Now some of them didn't even, I don't think ever get used. It just, that's what you're kind of rewarded for and given bonuses for. So without that, with everything being free and open and being able to draw from your user community as well, what dictates where your internal team spends their time and their focus and what are they, what innovations are they working on? How do you determine, you know, what, how, how to use their, their time and their resources um, and what, you know, what new things to, to invent? 
So, okay, so that's that's just a great question, and it and it speaks to the uh, I, I think how talented the people that we have are. Um, so, you know, there's if you count not only our users but the RepRap community. I mean, there's tens of thousands of people around the world that are exploring 3D printing, desktop 3D printing technology in this collaborative manner. And so the challenge for our R&D team is not, well, what individual weird idea can you think of that we can sneak past the patent office? It's, okay, use all this noise. You need to try to sift through it and find the ideas that, are, that actually work, that are commercially viable, that are scalable, and that complement the way that we're trying to serve our customers to make things easier for them. Because there's tons of cool stuff that people are doing with 3D printing, but you know it has to clear all of these other hurdles um, before we can really do it as a product and make money off of it. Um, so they are, have this really uh, challenging job of filtering through, trying to determine the signal from the noise of what's actually happening in the community that we as a company can contribute to and then commercialize and share with everyone else. Um, so it requires a lot of nonlinear thinking <laughs> hmm. uh, for for engineers, and so they're and and you know our our engineers are the kind of people that when they find something they'll get on our internal chat system and be like, hey, you got to come down here, you got to check this out. They'll post it on our forum, like they just want to share right away what they're doing, um, which is pretty fun. I love uh, the contrast when I talk to other folks in the industry who aren't taking the approach we are, and they're just very very hush hush. And I'm just like, all right, well I'll tell you what we're doing and. <laughs> If you want to tell me what you're working on, cool. But if not, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Know. So when I was there, I think the um, it might have been the Lulzbot Mini that was that wasn't hadn't been released yet, but it was being worked on. That's right. And what was so cool is you were telling me how everyone in the world who wants to know can know where it's at in the process, what it's going to look like so far. Uh, you know, what parts have been developed, what parts are still being tweaked, like. You get to kind of see this whole thing. It's not like waiting for the newest Apple product where it's, it's a big press conference and somebody in a black turtleneck comes out. Or I, I don't know, maybe <laughs> maybe without Steve Jobs, they don't wear the black turtlenecks. But And everyone's waiting. You know, what have they been doing in secret? And there's sometimes there's leaks and everything. It's the complete opposite. Everything is out there for every step of the way. Um, that was a really, really cool concept to me, to have this real-time feedback before anything is actually produced or, or put out in the market that you're already getting feedback on every step, every component from your, you know, users and, and people on the forum. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's really valuable. People will give us feedback right away. Uh, I mean, there are features on the Lulzbot Mini that we have not introduced yet for our, our bigger printer, the Taz, the, uh, our flagship. Uh, but we have customers that have done that. They bought a Mini, they had a Taz, they bought a mini, the newer, smaller one, and they basically retrofitted their TAS and then posted how they did it on our forum. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, they just, we, we have, uh, not all of our customers are hackers, but quite a few are. And, uh, and they really give us an earful sometimes. And sometimes it's good feedback. Other times it's, it's less <laughs> actionable. <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, overall it's good. <laughs> so, so if there's, if there's some young person listening to this and, and saying, Hey, I love this idea of, you know, uh, open source software of Libre hardware of this philosophy of openness of not, not trying to get a monopoly by going through the patent office, not trying to, to make a profit in the courts, but rather in, you know, in the court of, of public opinion or, or the marketplace. Um, but I just don't know if this works for any other industry besides 3d printing. I mean, what would you say? Like, do you think any business can operate in this way? Do you think that all businesses could strive to be uh, free from intellectual property? I mean, what would that look like? Sure. Well, I mean, every industry is different, but I think fundamentally, yes, I, I believe that any business can succeed um, without using things in the, the, the 21st century uh, you know, IP system because it didn't exist 250 years ago and there were plenty of businesses then. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, and not that I want to go back to the past. I love 2015. Uh, but, but, you know, it, but yes, it's certainly possible. Um, and there's, I mean, the big, one of the biggest examples is in software. So, um, you know, the hardware, hardware is following the example set by the free software community. And when I say free, we really mean free as in freedom, like the Libre use of the term yeah. rather than uh, gratis 
or, uh, you know, complimentary or zero priced or whatever. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, if you look, the, the GNU project, uh, was started about 30 years ago and the Linux kernel, which people are familiar with was developed as a part of that. And now you have these free software operating systems that people are running, uh, like Debian, uh, Ubuntu, and Fedora, or others. Uh, and then you have major companies, Red Hat being one of the biggest ones based in North Carolina. They're a uh, publicly traded company. They have thousands of employees all over the world. They do major enterprise level um, you know, systems, and they're competing with companies like Oracle and SAP, and they're on the software side. Um, there are, and then there are other industries where people just share because that's how it is, like in fashion, uh, for example. Um, you know, that's just, there, there isn't IP in that world, and so that's just the nature of things, uh, and, and they seem to be doing pretty well overall. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I, many years ago, I just had this assumption because I understand the the value of property rights and how any sort of functioning society and functioning marketplace, um, property rights are, are a precondition. You know, if there must be some way that individuals can own property and therefore trade it and all these things. And without, without really doing much of the intellectual work, I therefore assumed that intellectual property, um, you know, must be protected just because I think it had the word property in it. And so I just kind of assume, <laughs> well, yeah, property rights matter. You know, you can't have all the incentives are wrong. You can't have commonly shared goods. It's not possible. Somebody's got to decide, blah, blah, blah. And I always kind of fell back on this. Well, if you didn't have them, there'd be no incentive to innovate. And really the, the major turn for me, I, I was challenged by someone. And, and from a theoretical standpoint, I couldn't really think of any sound theoretical arguments um, in terms of like actually defining intellectual property, how should it be defined? How is it even possible to determine, you know, from sort of a rights-based standpoint, if I mix up some chemicals in my garage and I don't even know that someone has patented this and then I try to, you know, sell it as a different kind of paint and I'm sued, like what if, who, whose rights have I violated? It just seemed wrong theoretically, but I kept falling back on this practical idea that, well, without it, there would be no innovation. And the big turning point for me was I read this book by Boldrin and Levine called Against Intellectual Monopoly, which is a phenomenal book. I highly recommend it. Um, kind of a survey of, of history, the history of patents in particular. And it turns out, and there's been a lot of economic studies on the positive and negative effects of patents. And most of them will come to a very, like a conclusion that eh, it's tough to say, maybe it's a wash at best. And this book, uh, you know, leads to the conclusion that it's, it's actually worse than that, that the, the hindrances to innovation are greater than any potential additional incentives to innovation. And you see industries all around. You mentioned the fashion industry, uh, you know, in cookbooks, in football, there's no way to patent new plays, yet coaches are innovating all the time. And then as soon as they innovate, everybody rips it off. And this idea that no one would create anything if they didn't have a guarantee that they could be a monopoly producer of that thing is just nonsense. I mean, even in the patent world, most people don't wait and find out if they're able to patent something before they produce it. They have an idea they're passionate about, they're excited. And then somewhere later in the process, they go to the patent office and maybe get it and maybe they don't get it. Um, but that idea that no one would innovate without these intellectual property regimes is is pretty absurd. And in fact, the negative effects of all these companies just paying people to think up something that they don't even know how to use and then just file a patent for it so that they can sue people later. Um, it's, it's really, really problematic. So I get really excited when I hear you, when I hear you talk about this. And I think that's the way it's going. I mean, we've seen it in music that the, the bands who try to sue their fans instead of finding more innovative <laughs> ways to monetize. I mean, the internet itself, you know, I remember people telling me back in the day, well, there's no way it can last unless you charge people a ton of money because, you know, you can't just deliver this service for free. Well, you know, no, like no one's ever thought of advertising. There are different ways to monetize. <laughs> and I think if we push ourselves without running to that monopoly protection, good things can happen. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, it's just funny. I think, um, you know, I just think there's so many limitations to thinking that it has to be a certain way, you know, and I think people just push back so quickly. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I'm in school right now getting my MBA and the, you know, the econ class and patents come up all the time of, Hey, you know, this is a way to secure a market, you know, and it's just kind of taken as a given. Um, but one of the, one of our sort of fellow travelers in the open source hardware world, is a company named Sparkfun Electronics, and they're headquartered in Boulder. 
and they were founded in 2003 and they're they're a great bootstrap company and basically what they do is they sell electronics boards leds little motors for hobbyists and educational projects and things like that and uh, the founder founder of that company is a guy named nathan seidel and he talks about in a, in a really good ted talk um that he's done uh he talks about like intellectual uh, property obesity and he gives Kodak as the example of a company that really relied on, you know, their quote IP portfolio and became sluggish over time and uh, were really uh, turned upside down by the whole digital photography revolution. And this is a company where on paper you'd think they have like an essentially guaranteed future. Yeah. Uh, if, you know, if you go back, well, and, whatever, and the, the digital years. camera, I think was, <laughs> it was invented within Kodak, I believe. And by one of their, by one of their employees and they were kind of like, okay, we've seen it now let's put it on the shelf. Cause it threatens the, our traditional business model. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, so I, I, it may have been, in fact, uh, I'll have to rewatch the talk, but I know that, I mean, whether it was or wasn't, the point is they weren't ready, right? Yeah. So either they, either they didn't see it coming or even worse, they did and they shelved it on purpose. Uh, and then someone else found a way to do it. Um, but, uh, but either way, there's nothing, uh, there's nothing guaranteed in life. And, you know, I mean, patents don't apply internationally. I mean, there's all sorts of reasons why, um, that, you know, you, you getting, still, you still have yeah, to prove yourself work. in some other yeah. way. Yeah. To, to, and it really forces you to ask what do our, what are our customers actually buying? You know, the case of Kodak, if you assume our product is the thing that everyone's buying, then you get stuck trying to protect your product. But when you, when you're unable to maybe protect it from all the different innovations uh, that may come, not only tweaks on your product, but completely different things you never imagined, it forces you to ask a bigger question. What, our product is just a means to an end. What are the customers actually buying? You know, in the case of Kodak, they're buying a, a way to, to, to take a slice of time and freeze it, to, to buy a memory, right? Uh, to buy an image of a memory. And there's a, now that opens up a lot of different things. And, when, and it forces you to really kind of get to know What's the most valuable thing about us to our customers? Uh, to us, we say, oh, this piece of intellectual property, that's our great asset. That's what we need to protect. But that's only valuable if your customers see it valuable in helping them achieve some other end that someone else might help them you know, solve, solve differently. Um, okay, I want to ask you about 3D printing a little bit more uh, itself. It's a really, really, to me, fascinating and amazing idea very simple at its core but very very profound and actually I'll start with uh, relaying when I when I visited Aleph objects there was this like really weird moment it was it was, <laughs> it was wonderful you took me uh, upstairs in the facility and we walk into a room that's kind of just like rows of your own uh, lulzbot 3d printers and they're all like hard at work or two-thirds of them are and they're they're printing things and they're printing different things and there was no humans in there. It was this just like automated thing. And many of them were printing other like parts for other printers. So it's this whole rep wrap idea that the printers are creating the printers. And it was very weird. It was like, you know, a Terminator moment. The machines are now building smarter machines that will take us all over someday. But <laughs> I, I am a much more of an optimistic person when it comes to that. But really, really cool um, what's going on there. But But give us a... I don't know, for, for somebody who's totally new to 3D printing, what is it and why does it matter? Sure. Well, you know, 3D printing is, it's basically the, a way to bridge the gap between the digital world and the physical world. And it's a way to either scan something that exists today and then pull it up into this sort of utopia of the internet where anyone can have something, everyone can have something at the same time, <laughs> or there's almost seemingly no scarcity, right? In the digital world, uh, everyone's just sharing and collaborating constantly. Um, or you can pull it out from that, from the digital world into the physical world with a 3D printer. And it basically, you know, it's the more technical term is uh, called additive manufacturing. And uh, basically it's a way of making a thing by um, adding up layers, uh, by, uh, whether it's melting a plastic, which is how ours work. Others work by curing a liquid resin, um, others work by a laser hitting a powder, which like solidifies it, but basically you're, you're just building up, um, the, the inverse or the opposite would be subtractive manufacturing, uh, like a CNC machine drills away from a solid piece of metal or like a sculptor 
would start with a piece of marble and then chip away to sort of reveal a statue. Um, 3D printing is the opposite of that. Uh, so basically, long long story short. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, in, you know, immediately you start to realize some of the power of it just in the fact that it's an additive process instead of, you know, like, um, you know, even, even some of the molding and stamping processes in manufacturing, there's a lot of shavings and trimmings and leftovers, um, that, that can often be reused, but not always. And the, the precision of 3D printing is you can print it out with all the right lines and, and you know, cuts and, and layers that it needs without having to shave anything off or trim anything off without any wasted material. So that alone, when you're talking on huge scale, is a really big, important innovation. But this other idea that you mentioned that's so cool is just the the tran almost like the transportation aspect. So, I mean, if I want to want to order a, you know, whatever, a, a new door jam, um, it's got to be physically shipped from one place to the other, and that's that's a costly process. But if I there's a, somebody on the other side of the country who's got the in bits and bytes in ones and zeros the the information for the design of that door jam, and they send it to me over the internet, and it comes out my 3D printer. Now nothing has had to travel except for you know electrical currents, um, and that's a pretty big that's a pretty big innovation as well. Uh, what what to you is like, I don't know, the biggest implication or the biggest way in which we're going to see a changed world because of 3D printing? Well, I think there's, there's two really big impacts that are interesting to me. Uh, the first is the personalization. So because um, 3D printing allows, it's so easy to manipulate things, uh, you know, in, in 3D modeling software. Uh, it allows people to express themselves in, with physical things. You know, they can have their name on things, their face on things. One of the, you know, one of the most popular booths at 3D printing trade shows is, you know, 3D selfies where people stand in a booth and get a 360 <laughs> degree scan, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and so it's just this, uh, this really beautiful form of self-expression where people can, um, you know, their identity, they can, they can create, literally create their identity, um, you know, in the world around them. And so I think it's very empowering in that way. Um, and then, you know, the other neat thing is that it really distributes the ability to make things. So, you know, prototyping, coming up with new ideas um, is now a lot less expensive than it used to be. So it's easier to start a business or it's easier to just, you know, make a costume at home. It's w people that want to come up with ideas that are, you know, that are, that are related to the physical world or even, you know, in animation, a lot of designers, video game makers, digital animators will use 3d printing to get an idea of how their character is really coming along and developing. They'll print a model and, and then get a different take on, you know, what the dimensions of the character are or whatever. Um, but basically, you know, democratizing or distributing the ability to manufacture things. Uh, I think that's pretty exciting too. So you've got that, that flexibility and precision of, designing in the digital space and being able to get a design exactly how you want it. And then it translates immediately into the physical space, you know, without, without having to do a bunch of crude prototypes and, you know, do all the work of, of altering the physical, um, you know, the physical prototype, you do all the testing and, and tweaking on the digital side. And then that translates immediately into the, uh, I don't know, I guess the tip of the printer that it is, it is a pretty amazing, I mean, it's so simple, but it's so profound at the same time. So, okay. So you're the lulls bot is a really small. Um, I mean, even the, even the one that's not the mini that the Taz is really small. I mean, this is for kind of hobbyists. Um, are there massive 3d printers that are doing things on a much larger scale, like in a, in a manufacturing space? Sure. So, well, I guess what I'll say is we do have folks using our printers for manufacturing, like, you know, fairly large enterprise companies uh, that are making, you know, heavy machinery like tractors and automobiles will use them. But for for us, our printers, uh, it's a desktop size is how we think about it. There are some printers and there's more uh, more all the time that are capable of making bigger things. You know, like you'd think of like a chair, like if something the size of a chair that you could sit on or, mm -hmm. or a full size of you know, an average person, whatever that is, I guess, depends on where you are in the world. Um, but so there are, there are more efforts to develop things like that, but you tend to, once you're getting larger, larger form factor, you tend to lose some of the benefits of 3d printing, um, because 
there's sometimes often other materials that are more efficient, right? Like it wouldn't make sense to 3D print a house because, you know, wood and cement exist and steel exists and those tend to be better to do, you know, large, large building types mm -hmm. of things like that. Um, but it's, but it's certainly happening. And, you know, frankly, who knows? I mean, that's the beauty of the technology uh, is that uh, we think we know where it is now, but I mean, if you, if you told people, you know, 30 years ago, or it wasn't even around. If you tried to guess 15 years ago that Facebook would have existed, people just, I mean, they wouldn't have gotten it. So, so we don't know today, but I still barely get it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, who do you think like your, your, uh, Lulzbot mini is 1300 bucks. Um, pretty reasonable. I think my, I think the, the first computer my dad got, uh, I got it the same year I was born, uh, 1983. I can't remember. It was it was several thousand dollars. I mean, it was it was over two thousand dollars. It was certainly more than this this three D printer. So, um, and that was you know, only certain people. He was an accountant. You know, would get a would get a computer at home and to do certain things. Um, and in in today's dollars, that would have been even more. So, I mean, this is this is pretty cool. It's kind of a hobbyist thing. It's kind of a play thing for many people right now to experiment with. Um, you know, it, it's not seen necessarily as like really super serious yet. That's usually where innovations start out as kind of a, almost, almost a kind of a luxury good in some ways, but that's very reasonably priced. I mean, who, who should get one of these things? I mean, what, what would I do with a 3d printer? Would there be any point to having one? Sure. So, well, um, it depends on if you're interested in it personally or professionally. Um, you know, personally, a lot of parents will get one just because they're like, Hey, this is a fun way to, uh, spend some time with my kids and oh, by the way, I can print these little blocks that'll connect our different sets, our Playmobil with our Lego, with our connects, with the Lincoln logs, oh, that's you know, brilliant. we've got parents doing, yeah, doing cool stuff like that. Um, or, you know, Hey, you know, just little custom little trinkets for holidays, for costumes, for Halloween and things like that. So, you know, sometimes it's just a way to, to, to just kind of do fun things that can take time with kids, but they aren't actually that expensive. Like when I grew up, my dad and I used to do like model cars, mm -hmm. right? So you spend whatever 40 bucks in this little model car kit, but we end up spending like two days on it, putting this thing together. Um, so you see like parents, a lot of interested in applications like that. Um, professionally, you know, for you practice, you know, it could be doing, you know, little token, you know, sale of business development things for practice cost clients or for participants, you know, uh, engaging them and getting them, you know, little milestones showing that they've, you know, achieved certain levels of progress, you can send them little trophies, things like that. Uh, I mean, there's lots of lots of things you can do with it. Uh, I mean, the really the, the analogy of the internet, I think, is a pretty good one because it's like, well, what do you do with the internet? It's like, well, what do you want to do? You can check baseball scores, or you can just just sit on Reddit all day, or you know, whatever you want to do. Right? So on your, uh, I noticed on the Lulzbot website, which is l u l z b o t dot com, Lulzbot, um, you guys sell materials as well, and some of those. There are all different kinds of, of plastics, um, but there's some kind of like wood wood filament uh, as well. I mean, what are some of the materials that can be used um, and what are the most popular? Sure. So and so this really brings back to what what is the point of taking an open approach? Why is that so good? It doesn't seem very common, so why do it? Um, well, the materials are really one of the best examples for that. So we focus on building hardware that's easier to develop for, and as a result of that, the material scientists, the folks that are developing the stuff to print with, uh, really like working with our machines. So our printer is one of the most versatile ones that you can buy at any price point uh, because, you know, even going up, there are machines that cost tens of thousands of dollars that can't do what our printers can do um, because they're so easy to work with. And you have examples of rubber-like materials. Uh, there's one called Ninja Flex that's uh, made by a company named Fenner Drives. Um, there's heavy duty, like industrial materials like nylon and polycarbonate. Uh, and then, you know, down to more standard plastics, the, the most common ones that people print with are, um, PLA, which is like a starch based plastic, uh, ABS, which is what Lego are made out of those little Lego bricks. Yeah. And, uh, and then hips, high impact polystyrene is another one. So, and that's, and those, those, I, the last three I mentioned are kind of what you think of when you think of a, a plastic. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of different ones. There's, um, metal bent blended materials with like metal powder blended with plastic. So you've got bronze, copper, and brass filaments. Um, people are working on materials that conduct electricity, uh, carbon fiber, uh, bamboo materials, 
I mean, it's just, it's just, yeah, it's nuts. It's That's awesome. amazing. And, and it, it typically <laughs> yeah. comes for those who uh, are unfamiliar with this whole, <laughs> this whole world. The material comes like on a spool. It's usually like a, a thin sort of wire or um, a line kind of that feeds in and is melted by the tip of the printer. And then it prints these, these thin layers. Is that pretty much how it works with all the different materials? Exactly. For, for our, for our types of machines. Yeah. It's basically a, you know, a glue gun with a brain, uh, you know, for, <laughs> for want of a better explanation, but yeah. Um, okay. So I swear I read something maybe a year or two ago about 3d printing of food. Like someone was trying to 3d print a burrito or something like that. Uh, did I imagine this or is this something that people are playing around with? This is something that people are playing around with. Yeah. I mean, so, what's what's the material? So what the what people are really starting with is more of like a paste extrusion. So you know, printing things with chocolate or peanut butter uh, or frosting, things where you you know it's easier to like m manipulate like wheat or chicken. Uh, in the case of like, <laughs> if you're trying to like print a chipotle burrito, it'd be pretty hard. Ordering a spool of chicken uh, sounds <laughs> a little yeah. a little scary. Yeah, but like you know, um, you know, for if you if if you if someone were a chef, like I mean, I could see within the next five years the idea of you know someone having a food truck and then maybe they have like custom patterns that they maybe like uh, sour cream or guacamole or melted cheese on top of nachos or something like i mean that that where it's kind of like a like a semi liquid uh, whatever food that that's a lot easier to work with uh, I, I mean, people, companies are doing crazy stuff like organs and live tissue. Yeah, but, I've seen that but, uh, too. Like somebody, uh, that's pretty far out. Like part of an ear, or like a pr printing over like a big, a big flesh wound, and they're they're kind of filling it with some sort of live cellular tissue or something. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, all of that stuff is happening. It's hard to tell. Um, there's a lot of hype, I think, yeah. around what's possible because people are so excited. But it, it is hard to tell what's closer to the closer to market versus further to market <laughs> so if somebody is really new to the whole world of 3d printing um, but interested and wants to learn more do you have any recommendations for a book or a website or something they should check out that's not too overwhelming to kind of get their feet wet sure well i mean one of the best things that you could do would be to find a, a hacker space or a maker space in your local community um, almost all of them will have a 3d printer in there. And if you go, you see one in action and you get a chance to you know, go do a little class or, you know, local libraries are increasingly buying 3d printers and, and community colleges. That's really the best place to try to get started. Um, I, I would recommend that above all else, if someone really wanted to jump in, because once you see one and meet a couple of people, you get a chance to use the machine a little bit. And then, you know, you save up and for a couple hundred dollars, you can get an entry level hobbyist machine and, and start making things at home for, you know, uh, you know, as much or less than you'd pay for, you know, an Xbox or a PlayStation or something like that. And, and that can be a really good way to get started. Now, what about if someone is interested in learning more about, uh, the possibility of starting or running a business, um, completely open source or Libre? Are there some good websites or resources that, that talk about how, na how to navigate? Sure. Well, the best resource is uh, the Free Software Foundation. So if you go to fsf.org, uh, uh, it's really, really fantastic resource. The Open Source Hardware Association, OSHWA, O-S-H, WA uh, is also a great resource. Uh, you know, they're they're really two of the leading organizations on uh, you know applying. If you're interested, if someone's interested in technology, and if if they're really if you know if you're interested, if someone says, hey, you know, I believe in uh, free market or I believe in liberty, and these ideas are important, but I'm not really a techie. Um, this seems weird to me, and I like my MacBook, and I don't know, I don't want to be a Linux hacker. Well, then I would at least recommend that that person check out a program called Libre Office. L I B R E Libre office. It's a really perfectly good. In fact, in some ways I like it more than Microsoft office and you can use it for word documents, spreadsheets, uh, you name it. And it can export to those Microsoft file formats. So that's a really easy way. It doesn't cost you anything. And, uh, so that would, that's how I recommend people just dip their toe in. If it sounds good, but they're nervous to actually apply the ideas of, uh, of, of living in a world without, uh, software patents and things like that. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, what about, can we follow you on Twitter? You have a Twitter handle? Yeah. 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 I'm on Twitter at uh, Harris Kenny, H A R R I S 
K E N N Y. And uh, yeah, that's, that's the best place to, to find me online. Great. Harris. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. I appreciate you coming by. Oh, absolutely. Thanks, Isaac. Appreciate it. Yeah.